Thank you, Catherine. What a generous uh, uh, introduction. I can hardly wait to hear what I've got to say. Um, <laughs> quite stunning. Friends, um, uh, my name's Rob Carton. I too would like to pay my respects to the dark and young people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Um, uh, I'd like to pay my respects to your elders past and present and for keeping this beautiful land sweet for 40,000 years. Um, I very much appreciate that. My friends, um, I am so honoured to be uh, welcomed uh, this evening um, and to be uh, a very, very small part of what is a huge amount of work and a huge amount of dedication um, to a lifetime of craft um, of uh, the people involved in the collective and, of course, uh, the Greater Gosford community. It's a very real honour to be invited. So, Catherine, thank you very much for that thank invite. You. I do really appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> Friends, um, there's just a couple of things I wanted to um, reflect upon. Um, with regards to how this space came together and with regards to how I believe it will continue to nourish um, the artists that are present at the moment as well as the emerging artists from this uh, area. And I'd like to do it through the prism, I guess, of a couple of things that I learnt, um, uh, I guess, growing up and, and the number of things that I get asked all the time. And one of the things that I get asked all the time, uh, often from parents, sometimes from young actors, is, Rob, how do I get an agent? How do I, how do I make a break um, in the acting world? Uh, and my answer is generally always the same. It's forget about an agent. You're thinking about the wrong things. Always my answer is the same. Are you involved in your local theatre? Have you checked out Gosford Musical Society? Have you checked out Mad Cow Theatre? Um, have, you, uh, have, 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 have you into school productions? Have you done those things? Because it's not until we discover that we have a love for the doing of it that we... Sometimes we get confused. We love the idea of the success of it. And certainly in the modern world, with the notion of celebrity and the notion of instant fame and the internet, so often we do get caught up with a picture of ourselves as a star. Um, and let me assure you that the work that goes into getting any kind of notoriety, the hard work and the dedication is a thousand to one, two thousand to one in terms of the hours. So you better like doing it. You better love the craft. It better be part of your DNA because that's the stuff that will sustain us and that is the stuff that will nourish us. And, tr and, and rest assured, I think we've seen enough people fall over once they do get fame um, to recognise that perhaps it came a little quickly for those people and they weren't connected to the communities from which they came and the families with which nourished them. And I think on that because... For me, when I was young, growing up, it was the moment about film and acting school. I went down there because there was good-looking girls and there was a chance to do some acting. Um, and then from there, I also went from, to Australian Theatre for Young People. So growing up in Sydney, Australian Theatre for Young People down there in Sydney. I was also involved in the school productions. Um, and I can honestly say that this, the reason I get up in the mornings is because my sense of tribe, uh, my sense of kin, my sense of creative family and the, the emotions that I associate were very much built um, in my time as a young person, committed to the Mona Vale Film and TV Acting School. Of course I'd go to classes, but I was also one of the kids that helped build the place with the guy that was making it. I was also the kid that turned up on weekends uh, and, and ran other classes. That's what I was doing. And the beautiful thing about being involved in that space with all the other kids were doing it, through Mona Vale Film and TV Acting School, through Australian Theatre for Young People, they're all the people that are still doing it today. Yeah. Right? And whether they're acting, whether they're writing, whether they're involved in arts administration, costume design, production design, I see these faces all the time. And it's really, really important to remember that our youth and our young kids, anybody around the place that is showing any kind of attitude towards a creative life, it's coming from somewhere, from somewhere deep within. And as older people, it is imperative we nurture that. It's imperative we give them a place to come so they too can forge the ties, so they can build these emotional homes in their heart because these are the things that will sustain them when things get a bit tough. Yeah, And that's exactly what this is set up to do. This place is set up to do that. They've got specifically a program designed for emerging artists. Yeah, If young people are waking up and they're feeling like they don't have a place to go, what are they going to do? How are they going to do their time? Wouldn't it be great for their first thought to be, let's go down and see what's happening down here at the Collective. Wouldn't that be a lovely first thought? Rather than, let's go to the RSL, let's go to the pub. We're offering options to these people. They bring their own energy. It's up to us to provide structures around which they can gather and grow. Now, I mentioned that, I guess, my earliest thoughts 
of uh, kinship and, 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 and I was lucky too as a young person. I was in the year my voice broke when I was 15 years old. It was one of the great joyous experiences of my life going out and shooting in Braidwood with a whole bunch of other ragtag naughty kids. Uh, and and I, had some, I had some wonderful successes and, I, and I, I guess some of the most empowering, exciting things happened to me through my... Um, through, through acting as a young person. And I guess I was lucky in that I grew up with beautiful parents that loved me and a community that nurtured me. And so a lot of that was a very positive experience. And I do associate the creative arts with some of my highest highs. But of course, in my mid-twenties, early twenties, I also associate my lowest lows and those greatest feelings of disempowerment with that same art, with that same craft. To go for auditions as a 22-year-old guy, I had a literature degree, I'd done all of these things, I decided not to go to schools. And then all of a sudden, you know, sometimes when you're young, you wake up and you feel bulletproof, and you feel that the stars are going to shine on you every day of your life. And it's a wonderful thing, and I, I would never take that away from anyone. But at some point, in your mid-twenties, intimations of mortality start hitting, don't they? And all of a sudden, you're not the chosen one. You're not the kid getting all the auditions. All of a sudden... You're the guy that's been to a few auditions and you're waiting three, four months to hear back. Did I get the role? Please, did I get the role? And then I found out a couple of times, no, I didn't get the role. And I had no idea why. And this is the second thing I wanted to talk about. And this, I think, and I might sound vain saying it, I look back on that and I'm proud of how I handled those situations because I think it took courage. What I, what I needed to do at that point is to start getting a bit more real. As a young artist, there's a sense of, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and the world can off if it doesn't see my joy, if it doesn't see how good I am. But, of course, the world has a lot of other concerns on its mind, doesn't it? Hospital waiting lists, teaching, education, all of these things. Why does the artist get to sail through that without thinking about the business, without thinking about the money? Why does the artist just get to say, I'm special, you organise all the infrastructure that a great society needs? Well, in my mid-twenties, I felt so disempowered, I knew I needed to learn more about the business side of things. So that's what I did. And I learned to respect myself through it. I found out how business worked. I found out why other people got up in the morning. I made it less about me and more about what's going on in my community, what's going on in my society. How do business people earn their money so that I might be able to get a bit of it and push it towards my work over here? And how do they feel good about it? And how do I feel good about it? How can this be a mutually beneficial thing? I honestly believe I've got things for that the society can use and benefit from. So does a business person. But so often as a young artist, I was contemptuous of the business guy. And part of that was about fear. Fear that people would say, you know what, mate, I don't like your show, I'm not going to buy your ticket. You suck. <laughs> right? That's what people do when they come into contact with art. And art does that too, doesn't it? It's designed to sometimes make people feel uncomfortable. It's designed to try and inspire people to change. And often these feelings are uncomfortable. And that's what I went through trying to find out business, man, sitting down with a line producer and having some line producer tell me my show can't be this and can't be that, I wanted to punch him in the head. But I'll tell you what I did do. I didn't. I stopped and I asked questions and I found out more about why that person was questioning my artistic vision. And through that dialogue, through that conversation, I refined my craft. My craft got better. My artistic offerings got better. And I know through talking to Catherine and Alicia yesterday, that's what they found. By putting this cooperative together, by finding out about the business, the governance, the institutions that are around the place, the things that the council needs you to do so that they can look at you and go, you're not just a flaky, flaky person. You've got a drive and you've got a vision and you will turn up. And ultimately, that's what has to happen in the artistic world. You must set goals. You must have a look at the business that binds it. And I'll tell you why. It forces you to do two things. It forces you to respect all the other people in your community because they don't always get the get out of jail free card, I'm an artist, like we often do. And the other thing that it forces you to do is respect yourself. Write down the hours that you're gonna put in. Write down 
what this time is worth. And that's what I learned in my 20s. I'd been turning up to a telemarketing job and I was never late. And I earned $18 an hour and I put in when I was there. I was trying to write a play at the same time. Did I turn up to my desk at the same time every day? No. Was I being true to myself? No. And I looked at it and I thought, man, 18 bucks an hour is just buying me over here. And I'm not offering myself the respect. These are the things that I learnt growing up. And when I came through here and was listening to their business plan and listening to the setup of all the artists being able to be part of this business plan, so many of these artists would be working individually at home by themselves. And of course, great art needs time alone, needs time to think, needs time for deep thinking. But it's only through the offering of these ideas and the collaboration and the conversation and the refinement that comes through great dialogue that can happen in this space right here where we are, in that room, through the gallery when the public comes. These are the things that are going to make good art great. And so I, I'm really, really excited about the opportunity you guys have for that. The last thing I wanted to finish with, um, just a couple of thoughts that crossed my mind, and it was... Um, Inspired by an article I read in the paper today, I, I say that quickly, but I, I was listening to a friend of mine, John Colley, who wrote Master and Commander, and he wrote Happy Feet. He's an amazing uh, screenwriter, uh, a great gifted artist. Um, he's a Scotsman. And so he looks at our country with a Scots eyes, and he says, the, guys, I will never understand what it is about Australia. You often, in your script writing, belittle the place you come from. When you talk about Australia, all I ever see is the Harbour Bridge and the an Opera House. He says, do you people not realise that right on your doorstep you have the most beautiful, the most unique country on earth? And he referenced, um, he referenced the Hawkesbury. He referenced Brisbane waters. I mean, this land is ancient. And this land is beautiful. He said, if you could see this land through my eyes, then you would position your stories, you would position your craft, and you wouldn't constantly be looking overseas, wondering, are we good enough? You'd be looking at each other and saying, yes, we are. It was a wonderful thing to uh, be reminded of because so often we take it for granted. Um, and I think that's one of the jobs of artists is to remind everybody never to take anything for granted. We must keep the conversations going in that respect. So finally, the last thing, could you... And with regards to what art can be and how small it can start and how enduring it is, I thought this article in the Sydney Morning Herald today was a stunning reminder. Did anyone see this? The sister scientists excelled in their art. Two sisters in the 1850s and 1860s, Helena and Harriet Scott, it was a pretty chauvinistic world back then, but these women drew butterflies. And they drew them beautifully. Stunning, stunning colours. And not only did they draw them, they wrote them up. And they described them. They were scientists. They were gifted artists. And they were wonderful scientists. On Friday, an app will be launched featuring a hundred of their pictures with 180 different breeds of butterflies. And these were two women in Sydney, sitting in their garden, doing what they loved. And 160 years later, they're on iPads and iPhones all around the world, because what they were doing was utterly stunning. And so with that spirit, I have no doubt that the work coming out of this building here will live for many, many hundreds of years to come. And I can't congratulate all of the members of the collective enough. I've talked way too long. Leisha, over to you.